Second Sight Symposium on Artificial Vision. I can tell you that the times are exciting. Uh, almost uh, 15 years ago today, I met uh, Rob Greenberg and Mark Mayen for the first time. They were talking to me, uh, I was then a small electrical engineer, they were talking to me about the idea of uh, artificial vision. And they were like, telling me, we're going to make the blind sea. And I was like, wait, 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 you're telling me what? You're going to do what? Making the blind sea is unbelievable. Yet, today, 15 years, in 2013, on uh, Valentine's Day, if you can believe it, uh, we got FDA approval for the Argus II retina coffee system. The first time ever we can bring an artificial vision to the public in the USA, two years after getting uh, European approval for the retina implant. Uh, artificial vision and bringing the vision to the blind is one of the most complex projects that was ever made. And making a retina implant that works can be implanted reliably by a wide variety of surgeons, uh, it's sustainable, it's sustainable year after year, not failing, not having any corrosion issues. It's a huge engineering challenge. And uh, putting people to the moon, I can tell you that in comparison, is a simple project. Uh, so today we have four excellent speakers who have all of them introduced in some way, shape or form the artists do in their clinical practice and they are going to tell you a little bit of different aspects of bringing the, this technology to the patients. Uh, Argus 2 today has been introduced to 67 patients. Uh, today we have 64 that continue to use the system day after day. And uh, the benefit and the complexity of explaining the benefit to the patient is something that we almost learn. I also want to tell you that this is the beginning. In October, we are going to be issuing a significant release with significant improvements in the benefit you can translate to the patient. And we are going to be seeing in the future for all those patients that already have been treated uh, and the future patient a continued improvement of the benefit. Today, for certain type of patients, we can cure blindness. Is it? I leave the floor to Stanislaw Rizzo, who then is going to be uh, letting speak Thomas Ophelsdager, Marco Mora, Fernando Arevalo, and Stanley Zotto. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start very soon. Thomas Wonderberg. Thomas will talk about the solid impact and evolution of the retinal prosthesis. Thank you very much. Stella. I would like to introduce this uh, symposium just by giving you a, a short overview of what actually happened before uh, an epiretinal stimulator came onto the uh, market because uh, this is a very exciting story and, and you might be surprised that, that the whole story really started with a beautiful lady, uh, as you can see here, on, on the left, and uh, many of you recognize this lady, and it is, of course, Carla Bruni. Now, why is Carla Bruni so important for artificial vision? Well, it's one of her forefathers in Turin, who, in 1748, was the, the first person who tried to apply electricity um, in an ocular context, and he very happily uh, reported that uh, two or more treatments uh, were able to cure the eye. In the uh, 18th century, a, a French uh, doctor, uh, Le Roy, was very active in his field. And uh, he then pushed uh, this project a little bit further, where he treated different um, diseases with electricity, as he reported in this uh, memoir. And uh, he was a very uh, good observer, and he described what the patient could actually see once he was stimulated with these electrical currents. And he wrote here in old French that see like a flame uh, coming out uh, from the eyes and uh, you could hear an explosion like 12 cannons so you can imagine what sort of uh, currency this person applied but um, he reported very good results uh, he described how he would wire these uh, electrodes around the head and around the leg and 
And uh, he described that along with pain of the stimulation, the patient re received vivid flashes of light, and uh, he had uh, several treatments, but unfortunately, he did remain blind. Uh, the Americans also uh, chipped in, and uh, Benjamin Franklin, after his famous um, experiences uh, with, with uh, uh, lightning, etc., um, was uh, observing other electrical um, effects on, on um, vision. And uh, John Wesley, who is more known to be a Methodist preacher, also did several experiments uh, using electricity, trying to make people see. And he described a man who had been blind for years. He was electrified and it drew sparks from his eyes. And the patient could distinguish objects and walk home without a guide. And after a second treatment, he was able to work normally. So this is really what we aspire to um, with the new implant. Further on, 1800, uh, Volta, who we know um, now with the volt, voltage of currency, uh, applied the current to the eyes of uh, different patients. And later on in Germany, also electricity was used to try to treat optical nerve disease and, and retinal disease. Uh, one of the giants, Hamilton Helmholtz, decided that uh, the negative uh, part of the electric system was applied to the eye that people could see more clearly, but if you use the anode, uh, that uh, made things dark and less distinct. And again, in, in the Americas, uh, the first time RP patients were really uh, treated, or people tried to treat retinitis pigmentosa patients by using electricity. So it goes way back into the 19th century that these patients uh, were thought to be some good um, subjects to use electricity to make, make them see. And um, as, as you go on, many eccentrics and sometimes not so serious, but sometimes serious scientists have performed very colorful experiments using electrical stimulation in humans. And uh, this year, as uh, Matheson's et al. in 1911, they used a uh, coiled magnetic field of sufficient strength to in induce phosphines. And more coils could be wrapped around the head to increase the effect. And uh, this is what it looks like. And, I don't know about you, but this reminds me more of some sort of serious uh, torture chamber than uh, uh, a medical application of, of electricity. Also in France, uh, people tried to work on this, and uh, uh, Paul Houdin was able to improve retinitis pigmentosa, but very unfortunately, he had no results in treating glaucoma with this equipment. Again, uh, this. Uh, went further on, particularly also in the States, where people would travel using electrical uh, stimulators, such as seen here, and these uh, would be applied to the eye, uh, no longer than one minute, uh, to uh, make people see. But this really is more uh, for interest sake and, and just uh, as a lighthearted introduction, and the more serious aspect really started in 1956, and this was the first proper scientific approach to a subretinal or an epiretinal um, uh, stimulator. And this was a, a, a patent application by uh, Graham Tassica uh, in Australia uh, describing this, uh, this sort of chip which he wanted to implant into the eye. And this was from his um, uh, publication where he had one human patient and I just want to, to read this because Nowadays, we all want to have double-blind, uh, randomized trials, but this is just a case report uh, 60 years ago, and just know the way that this is described. The author himself um, acknowledged that the patient was not a very good witness, uh, but some consideration can be attached to her claims. And by no means was the patient the ideal patient, as the surgery involved was partly experimental in that case, no great effort was made to plot the patient's visit with the field before and after the operation. So, very cavalier approach to, to scientific um, uh, uh, examination <coughs> and expertise. And uh, also, uh, during the operation, he conceded that he, he couldn't really put the stimulator where he wanted to put it, and so he decided to place it behind the choroid and not behind the retina. And, uh, but nevertheless, all went well, and um, she could see uniform light, and uh, this led to the belief that the retina 
corresponding will in fact be stimulated even through the even through the core. Uh, slightly um, uh, lately, this is uh, disconcerting because he also writes that since his paper was published uh, or prepared, the eye has been removed and, and sectioned, and this will be reported elsewhere. So this is now where we are. There are many different uh, implants, and this is the sort of uh, vision you can expect. So around 1.8 log mark uh, vision, and we'll hear about this in much more, more detail later on. Now a lot of people have said, well, you know, critical voice, why do we need this? It's technically too complicated, the resolution is far too low, there are too many surgical complications, and it's really reversible. Others have said the price is far too high in this day and age. This is the national debt problem of the USA, and you can hardly count the numbers. So do you really need this sort of um, technology? Well, in response to that, uh, in 1886, um, Carl Bent was the first one to uh, create an automobile. And this automobile had one horsepower at a maximum speed of 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. He had to change the brake pads every 50 kilometers to actually make this thing run. And of course, at that time, people were laughing because this was less performing than a horse. Or, or maybe just people, but uh, now we, we, we deal with something like that. So I think the technical evolution will go forward and uh, refinements will be done. And I think we, in this famous uh, adoption of technology curve, I think we, we are somewhere here where there is a tipping point of acceptance of this technology and also application of this technology in a much more widespread fashion uh, around the world. And although it may have looked slightly incongruous at the beginning, I think uh, the future will prove the developers of this uh, implant right that it was the right technology for this sort of disease. Others have said that the price is far too high, but as you know, if you go into mass production, uh, even a fiat chimpanzee chain that will become available for almost everybody um, uh, in terms of price. So what will happen in the future? Well, as Niels Bohr said, we don't know. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. But uh, we will see in the next uh, couple of talks that the future is already here in part, and it's very exciting. Thank you. Moreover, from Amsterdam, we talk about his experience in the Irish to it one. Michael, please.
devices to the test of course for days before surgery to make sure that there was not something is going to work with the patient. Uh, also the patient has to be prepared for the surgery and what nowadays we do is uh, we, we take the lens out of the patient for other surgery to prevent it and uh, uh, you may decide if you want to try the side or you want to take it. But it's something that would be advised to do in advance because you don't want to have uh, a done deal the surgery itself where the visualization of your of your of your cornea and of your video will come uh, easily and with a few difficulties with the surgery itself. Uh, also the patient has to uh, get uh, a lot of medications to be really advised for the before the time of the surgery and uh, and uh, the actually uh antibiotics and and and, and, and steroid tablets which has to be used for, for some time of the surgery to try to minimize the post operative population. Um, extraocular, I will uh, just touch some of the more uh, delicate points uh, of this uh, extraocular intraocular placement of the, of the device and then I'm also sure that you are going to happen in the reality. Um, uh, what is very important when you do this type of surgery, of course, is that they said do not try no damage to the implant. The implant is basically uh, it's, it's, it's coated in a silicone, in a silicone case. And, and that is very sensible to all the sharp instruments. So what you have to remember is that you cannot use really the instruments you are used to sometimes in the surgery without special instruments, uh, silicon coating that you have to, to use and all the sharp objects that should be removed uh, from, from the operating uh, table just to avoid getting contact with the implant itself. Um, the, 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 the surgery as you can see here um, has a different uh, different timeline uh, we reported also cases going from two to eight hours, but uh, the last cases that we we done and um, uh, the surgery is between always about two hours. I don't think it's also the case last couple of days we we managed to do it in, in less than two hours time. So what I want to say is that this type of surgery is something we are we are actually used to. There are several steps which we are used to perform for normal uh, retinal pathology, and it's something not that we have to invent ourselves. So it's a quite of standardized thing. Um, if we're going to start basically with the open the computer, uh, what is very important here is to remind that you have uh, not to uh, basically do the same way you used to do for attachment because the implant case is going to be placed in super temporary. So you have to try to keep the computer tie by intact in that sector to avoid the essence of the wound. So if you want to do a relaxing procedure, it's not necessary, but if you want to do it to, to create more space, you always have to do it nasally just to avoid the uh, later problem with your wound in the supratemporal organs. This is, to my, to my uh, experience, uh, the most important step of the operation, uh, to put the band under the muscles, like a normal buckle procedure, and to really place the center exactly correctly the electronic case in the right position. If you manage to do that in the first attempt, your surgery will become very easy and will become fast. And um, because uh, um, the orientation and angulation of the case has a, a huge impact on the, um, on the uh, rounding of the cable inside the eye. And the cable has to be as flat as possible on the retina surface without uh, any possibility of torsion. And if you manage to do that, uh, on, uh, placing the case in a, in a correct position, uh, you will have a very easy time afterwards. This case has to be basically sutured with uh, the uh, like Speaking here, five zero national sutures. There are two special tabs on the implant itself. You just fix it. These people have experience with the glaucoma surgery, implant imbalance. It's a quite similar uh, procedure. Um, uh, once you fix the electronic case in place, you also have to fix the coil. You saw the first slides, which is basically the communication antenna between the, 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 between the intraocular part of the implant and the the glasses which the patients are uh, used to, uh, to, to see the, the, the outside work. And this is also to have a special measure and avoid while you switch to this, also get rotation to the cable. This is basically a scheme that uh, explains a little bit uh, how we do. As you can see, this is the right eye, superior polar up. Uh, the superior temporal polar is the place where the, uh, where the cable of the cable is going to go inside. Uh, you have to make this drop and how to read it about. There is where we usually place uh, the chokers, so uh, we do this type of, uh, of surgery uh, at the moment, at least in my case, uh, uh, with the uh, part uh, chokers, uh, 25 inch, and uh, we enlarge only one part, which is the larger, one larger instrument, which is the, the retinal duct uh, forceps. But all surgery is done in a closed environment, 25 inch, 
and then we said uh, that allows us also to reduce turbulence during the surgery and to avoid the uh, genetic damage of uh, um, moving the electrode inside the side of the eye. Here it states uh, that in the light of the channel, we don't need that anymore. We use just a normal foot package channel and we use a channel in the right to the procedure. After placing the, uh, the device around the eye, uh, we have to perform a post-infectomy and we are also used to that. Of course, this type of patient sometimes in the channel will be also in touch with the posterior eye roll, which is a very ideal post in time. Sometimes you can do that manually with your with the forceps, in fact, as much as much as possible. And afterwards, it's a peripheral membrane resin, you remove the peripheral membranes, we actually never attempt to do the higher than you do to avoid the epigenetic damage with this uh, quite thin and delicate greatness. And after we basically perform an effect, we introduce the array in the progesterol in the in the in the in the in the idol. And then uh, how do we do this? We basically use a epigenetic uh, forceps type to grab the the array itself, a special little tap, which is pretty made to help to remove that. And we slide it inside the, the eye. We use a special simple mode of forceps to allow the cable to get in without being damaged. Once this is done, this is the second most important step to my own view, my is make sure that your decision doesn't leak. Because you don't want to have uh, um, um, problems in the post operative period like hypopony or like uh, the, the uh, endophthalmitis, uh, you know, the wounds are not uh, uh, closed in the proper way, and um, that can create uh, um, a lot of problems. We also suture the, the wounds we made with the 25 page camera just to avoid any possible um, leakage. This is the, what we are used to, which is the, the, TAC, uh, the, the TAC tool, it's a special process so where you basically engage this little uh, needle, which has a spring, and uh, it takes some, some, uh, some, some, uh, some uh, learning process to understand how it works, um, but uh, basically uh, we, uh, we just slide in this TAC tool on the, on the needle, and when you release it, we're also the same movement, so it goes sideways, not in the way, otherwise you wouldn't move. <laughs> what is really important is to make sure that the retinal attack is in the proper position because of this uh, charging and this loading uh, um, system, you can sometimes be not aligned. But once it's basically straight and is aligned, you are quite sure that your attacking will be successful. Uh, as it's written here, sometimes people can feel a pop while you're attacking the tool. Uh, that's actually not my experience. So what I usually do, I just look and I see an indirect signs of pressure on the retina. I will show you later in the video that because sometimes you press in uh, the back of place, you see the retina whiteness and things done. So I'm quite sure that I'm in the right lane and the tool and the back of the system will be uh, loaded in the tool. We place a mattress suture, also like a barbell procedure, to make sure that the table stays flat on the retina. So then we cover that with the donor tissue that can be the spare and if we use my cat because we don't want the best results. And this is basically a diagram of the, 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 the device that the, the RA is in the place. And this is how it looks in a tissue as you see. The center of the folder and then uh, this uh, uh, make sure this is absolutely not twisting on the cable. That's why the position of the case is very important because the cable is twisted, the implant can tend to rotate, and it's of course not nice. This is a uh, video of the surgery. As you can see here, I'm a person with a periphery, and as a side, I isolate the four rectile muscles, <coughs> like we always do for a normal uh, back in, uh, uh, procedure. Then we will slide the implant under the leg and the, the muscle. The depth can be sometimes a bit uh, common to the implant. This is quite a bit of but the patient will slow and pushing it towards the side. Then we basically secure the, the RA in the middle of uh, bag just to avoid any damage during the procedure. Um, as I said, it's a surgery of little details. Um, these are the only times where you can use a normal type of forceps where you can just to put the um, sleeve uh, uh, inside the box basically just to, to secure the, 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 the simple line. And this is a marking process. We put 
because we, we pre mark the area in the sky where the airborne will place the concaves, we pre pass the sutures, and then we go bluntly from the back side of the needle in the, in the, uh, the silicon tabs just uh, uh, to avoid punching the silicon itself. If the silicon is punched, of course, you can have the leakage inside and you can damage the, the needle. Afterwards, we do. Uh, uh, Four ports in this case, but finally, technically, because one port is the here, as you can see here. We, um, um, we go over and move the computer's body. Um, I always use Transcendental because this station, as I said, is extremely sometimes it is similar to the challenge to reduce the And then in this case, uh, I didn't manage with the normal cutter, so I'm touching it with the forceps. And once it's touched, then you can see it very well that it's uh, now it can uh, reduce. Um, try to detach as much as possible, of course, not, uh, uh, as we discussed yesterday, it's not really important uh, to remove the completely the pieces. Uh, it is important to remove completely the place where you're going to put the, the array inside and the cable inside to avoid traction. And afterwards, in the perpendicular external incision, 5 mm, we grab 35 gauge forceps, the tap on the uh, uh, electronic array. We slide it inside, inside the eye. As you can see here, I'm using now a special silicon coated uh, uh, forceps to slide the cable inside, to avoid pinching in the cable. This is also a very scary moment when the uh, second center zone is always uh, next to the neck. You better be careful, don't punch the cable. And uh, that uh, looks very simple, but the cable is quite fast, but so you may inadvertently pinch it. That can be the leakage inside the device and malfunction. So, this is also very important. Do not touch the cable. Make sure your uh, sutures will bite in a really tight and there is no leakage. This is the tacking procedure. So, you can see this. We open a new port, a 30 gauge port. And you can see it's actually a quite simple procedure. It just lasts a couple of seconds. You just hold the one end with the, the, the array. You want to the only force you can apply in a very manual fashion. Just put it in the place you want, and as you just push, you see some whitening uh, behind the, 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 the plate of the array, and, and this you slide it out. And, and then it's done. This is a process for cadmium. You can use to cover the cable and the, the edge of the front case to avoid friction. Of course, one of the other important uh, problems, uh, if you don't do that carefully, is that you can have a plant to the diamond. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marco. Now, Fernando Rebao from the Hospital in Saudi Arabia will present his experience about the two implants that they performed in Riyadh. Thank you very much this time. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Second Side for the uh, opportunity to be here and to speak about Jeremy's tool implant and our uh, initial experience in the Middle East. So the question is how did we become a site uh, to the Argos II? And I'm sure uh, many people here and institutions are wondering how to do this. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of how, how we did it. So uh, the first thing that we did was to uh, invite uh, Mark uh, Omayon to our hospital. Uh, he's been a friend for many years, so we showed uh, Mark the facilities uh, in the hospital and uh, uh, our ORs and uh, different uh, equipments that we have. We have 15 ORs, uh, and, uh, and he was very impressed. Um, just to make sure uh, that he gave a good word to second side so that we could become a site of the, uh, for the implant, we made him happy. As you can see here, he's enjoying very much land. So after that, it was uh, a matter of getting funding. Um, these implants are costly, uh, rightly so, and, uh, and there is a commitment to a certain number of implants to become a site. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Abdullah uh, Torki, who is uh, the uh, general executive director of our hospital, and uh, he has been instrumental in uh, getting funding from the Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia to uh, get the money for the implants. 
and uh, our patients don't pay uh, anything for uh, the implementation of the Airbus too. So uh, during the um, months that uh, followed, uh, we came up communication with Second Side, and uh, and we organized uh, finally a, a visit, a site visit, and uh, we uh, meanwhile had our patients, candidates, patients uh, ready for them to to uh, to see. This is our our first uh, patient uh, seen here with uh, some of the um, people from Second Side as well as Greg uh, uh, and Brian uh, and. Um, Tarek, who is uh, our chief of optometry, and uh, uh, the uh, people from uh, the company uh, taught our faculty to uh, examine and screen our patients with the hospital system to make sure that the candidates are good for uh, the uh, procedure. So we also uh, made sure that the people from second site were happy and we could become a second a site for the uh, Argos implant. So um, the next step was to get a very um, experienced uh, surgical uh, retroretinal surgeon. Uh, and uh, my friend, Stano uh, Rizzo, uh, was a little hesitant at the beginning to go to Saudi Arabia. So how can you convince uh, uh, an Italian guy to, to go to Riyadh? Uh, it, it took a lot of thought. Uh, we could give some put to Greg and, uh, and to, uh, to Mark, but uh, the stand was more difficult from Italy, excellent to sing in Italy, so this was going to be tough. So, we did a party. Uh, we gave a stand a lot of wine, very good wine, and uh, some entertainment. And a stand of Candy agreed to come to Riyadh. And this is very important to have somebody who is experienced in the procedure to assist you during the first uh, few ones so that you can feel more confident and, and do the right thing. And his uh, advice during the procedures were, were really uh, outstanding and very uh, instrumental to, uh, to achieve success. So uh, before the uh, procedure, uh, maybe um, 48 hours uh, before the surgery, uh, the uh, second site team, which is a gave lectures regarding the um, surgical technique and everything that not only the surgical faculty but also the uh, nurses in the OR needed to know about the Argus too, so that the, um, they would be ready for us during the um, actual surgery. Another thing that they did that I thought was very important is uh, this model eyes where uh, we could practice the tacking of the implants. None of us have been trained on, on tacking implants uh, or tacking in the retina. We are, uh, this is a very old technique, and, uh, and they uh, take the um, uh, um, extra step to bring this model eyes and, uh, and the tacks and the forceps to uh, the handles to uh, teach us how to uh, tack before the uh, actual procedure. So after we became proficient in tacking, then we we're ready to uh, uh, perform the Argus II surgery. So uh, retinal prosthesis implant was uh, performed for the first time in February uh, 2nd uh, of this year, and uh, a second patient was, was done on February 3rd. Uh, we performed a, a surgery on patients with Panza retinitis pigmentosa. The patients are doing very well. Uh, at six months, they are already able to see doors, uh, people passing by, and buildings outside. Uh, so I'd like to show our first uh, surgical procedure. Uh, you just saw the uh, wonderful surgery by uh, Dr. Mora. Uh, I'd like to show you our surgery. Uh, Stano Rizzo and uh, Dr. Sabal Rashid, one of my faculty, who's been also instrumental in this project, uh, were assisting me. So again, uh, we uh, perform the uh, normal steps for any body procedure, uh, referring the rectus muscles. And uh, we're placing the implant uh, with the coil that is going to be passed uh, under the lateral rectus muscles, uh, muscles you can see uh, here. So it's very important again to uh, manipulate the coil with the uh, forceps uh, with the uh, silicon tips 
and your fingers is the best way to avoid uh, damaging this uh, uh, coil. And uh, uh, after you pass it under the rectus, uh, the rectus muscle, then the case is located supratemporally, and the rest of the uh, band easily goes uh, under the remaining rectus muscles. A watch sleeve is used to uh, uh, secure it in the uh, superior nasal quadrant, and we use uh, fibro nylon to uh, fix it uh, to the sclera. Uh, we also use uh, fibro nylon to uh, fix the case to the sclera shown here, and the coil as demonstrated uh, in the uh, video, uh, as you can see. So after you have the uh, external part of the implant secured, then the trachoma is performed. We use the 23 gauge uh, valve uh, trunkers for uh, this purpose. And, uh, and we also use a uh, uh, chandelier at 6 o'clock for bimanual uh, manipulation of the um, uh, array uh, intraocular. So notice that the um, nasal um, sclerotomy or trunker is located inferiorly so that we don't have to uh, open an extra sclerotomy to uh, attack the uh, implant and this is a trick uh, that was uh, uh, that I learned from Dr. Riso. So again, uh, transinolone is utilized to uh, perform the uh, trichotomy and the dealing with the posterior hyaloid. Uh, we are not uh, thorough uh, in terms of uh, uh, peripheral vitrectomy. We don't think it's uh, necessary. And uh, after uh, the uh, vitrectomy, then the sclerotomy is uh, opened in the uh, super temporal uh, quadrant, five millimeters, to be able to insert the array uh, with the forces that's uh, shown uh, here. Again, uh, a, 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 these forceps will allow the introduction into the vitreous cavity. Very careful manipulation of the uh, cable and suturing with the uh, vitreal, uh, seminal vitreal, as uh, demonstrated. Then the tacking has been done, has to be done uh, through the same sclerotomy where the uh, trucker was before, but then it has to be extended to uh, 20 gauge, a little bit more than 20 gauge to uh, 40 inch of the introduction of the tack. Then uh, intravitrally, uh, we uh, make sure that the uh, array is located in the foveal area. In your in desired position, you can do that uh, with the actual the tack with one hand or you can use uh, two instruments uh, and do it by manually uh, since you have the uh, chandelier. Once you're happy with the position, then you just uh, uh, press to tag and release to uh, leave the implant in the desired uh, retinal position in the foveal area. So this is the most uh, tricky part of the surgery again because we're not used to that. But after that, everything, or before that and after that, everything goes pretty smoothly. So we place a tunoplast uh, over the area of the uh, cable of the array uh, to avoid any uh, conjunctival erosion, uh, which is one of the complications that were earlier described in the clinical trials. And we close the sclerotomies and the conjunctiva to finish the uh, procedure. So, this is the uh, first uh, post operative day examination of the patient. And uh, there was a press release that gave a lot of, uh, uh, had a lot of uh, uh, splash in the uh, Middle East. So, we have done two patients so far, so we're starting our experience, but we're going to do another four cases uh, in the first week of November. Uh, the uh, main duration of surgery has been three hours. The first uh, surgery was two hours and 50 minutes. Uh, there have been no uh, related adverse events or serious adverse events in our patients. So this is the uh, first patient, and uh, you can see here uh, the uh, perfect location of the implant in the, in the foveal area and the uh, perfect uh, relationship between the implant and the retina on the OCT. Uh, the patient has received eight rehabilitation sessions that have been done during the last six months, and the patient is already able to uh, detect doors uh, in a corridor, uh, detect obstacles, uh, find a person in front of him, and detect flowers and grass areas uh, outdoors. 
This is a video that shows uh, how the uh, patient early uh, after the implantation uh, is able to uh, detect the uh, presence of uh, doors in our hospital. This is obviously with the device on. Uh, this is a patient that had uh, barely light perception. Now he's able to, now in another area of the hospital, he's able to uh, determine the uh, presence of uh, doors and, and, and where they are and, and, and cross them if you wanted to. In addition, uh, he has been able to determine uh, on a white uh, background uh, black areas, as you can see here. Okay. So he's very excited, very happy, and uh, uh, very cooperative with all the uh, evaluations uh, for, for the uh, feeling of the implant. So on the second patient, we had some complications during surgery. Uh, this is a patient that had a scleral band already present, and a subretinal membrane close to the fovea, and a retinal fold over the fovea. The procedure went well, and we tacked the implant, however, <coughs> Um, even though it looked okay during the uh, surgical procedure, the OCT shows a large separation between the uh, implant and the uh, between the array and the uh, retina. So, uh, however, after several rehabilitations, the patient uh, is very happy. Uh, she's able to find doors, uh, follow uh, ceiling lights in the corridor, and see people pass by. When we uh, comment to this patient that we would like to do a recreation to uh, make the uh, array closer to the retina. She gets very angry and, uh, and she says that she's just uh, very happy with the procedure. So we're leaving it as it is so far. So we're planning new uh, rehabilitation sessions, uh, new daily uh, uh, evaluations will be done the, uh, next month. Uh, so what do we think is uh, the future? Uh, we think that it's, uh, there's going to be an increased usability and utility of the prosthesis. Uh, the uh, company is working on the advanced processing of the visual information, including applications that will allow the patients to recognize uh, faces, uh, 3D vision, night vision, and color recognition. Uh, we are uh, thinking about uh, research and expanding the indications, including uh, patients with uh, better visual acuity. Uh, a and D uh, indications and also uh, other forms of retina degenerations uh, other than retinitis pigmentosa. So in summary, uh, the device has enabled clinical trial participants and now post-marketing patients who are uh, profoundly blind to uh, uh, see shapes, uh, locate objects and recognize large letters as has been demonstrated in these studies and users of the device perceive patterns of light which they learn to interpret as a vision. Uh, this is my surgical team, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, KCASH for the work of the study group, especially Dr. Saba Al Rashid, uh, who is uh, working with me in this project, Victoria Dubela Al Twerki, Marco Mayon, Stano, and of course the wonderful team of Second Sight. Thank you very much.
these are directly in the body of the screen of the computer. For example, square identification, 25 is per square in the, in the dark area of the screen of the computer. For example, the grading, the direction of this screen in the computer, and you know, on, on the one of its tests. These, these are tests are very important because, of course, they indicate the quantity, the level of the joyful is all the same. And of course, also the different fields. These are different fields of fields starting from some islands or residual visual fields to arrive to very railway or to very small area of visual field. These are preoperative aspects of visual field fields for our patients. So, and also important is the OCT, the anatomical uh, result that give that field view of the OCT. This, for example, is a could not be a good patient because he has a small scar in the macro eye. This could be a not a good patient because he has, for example, a big staphyloma. And maybe the OCT, the array, doesn't fit very well on the surface of the macro. This is an excellent candidate, a candidate for example. Good uh, macro area, flat, flat regular and posterior pole, of course, uh, uh, predictably the generation of the, uh, the generation of the external areas of the red. So we have the this indication is very important because of course the success of your surgery, the satisfaction of your patients depends on these conditions. So these are our eleven patients operated in the last three years. We start in October 2011, arrived in two weeks ago, then foster them from 2013. These are the, the mean age some patients are very young, for example, 37 for some 30 years old to arrive to 60, 60, 61, 65 patients. The mean age is very, 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 very low. So it is the time of our surgery, which this is thanks to Greg for the courtesy of this slide, we start from about the first patient about three hours and a half to arrive the last patient about less than two hours. This is because the learning curve, of course, to understand that some steps are very useful, some passages are very, very dangerous sometimes. You arrive at, uh, to uh, obtain this very good time, in the, in, in, like in normal surgeries or visual surgery. I like to present some results for a patient. Of course, the, the, these results are coming from the six patients in the hospital with the more than one, one year old. This was the first patient operated in October 2011. It was a male with, in, with the, about six years old. This was the preoperative OCT. You see, in the Vertical scan, the LCT appeared very well. See, of course, there is a, pro a profound retinal degeneration in the external layer. But if you see the original scan, you see the staphyloma. Many of the patients have the staphyloma because many of the patients are amniotic. And you have some limits to implant the, the iris array. The limits of the uh, actual, actual length goes from 22 millimeters to about 26. This patient was a uh, limit, it was 25 pound nine. It was the first. Of course, we were uh, happy to begin with this patient before it was, was selected. You see this, uh, the OCT before, before the result. You see this, starts up the This was the preoperative, uh, of course, you need to see the square localization. The, the patient localized only 5% of this square, this big square, a very bright square in the this is the bar, the bar uh, <coughs> this is the bar of efficiency, about 10% of the post We did the surgery, the surgery was very, very smooth. This is the, the manual of tack. Normally we use a final maneuver to, 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 to tack the, the array. This was a, a, the first implant that we do. And this was the the, 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 the the array was very well positioned of this the nerve. The array, of course, is coming from the temporal part, the temporal quadrant. This is the array is perfectly positioned on the center of the part. But, but the results weren't very good. You see, this is uh, the sixth channel stimulated by, by of course, by energy. See, in, the, in, the, in blue, the, we use, of course, low energy. <coughs> in the green, we use uh, more energy. And there are some, some channels which didn't work at the time, up to months. This is why. So they also say that the, the, the result of three months were not very satisfied because we are 3.75% of the positive results response in the This was because for the staphyloma, the, the, 
the array is a bit very well on the policy if you have some distance from the array to the array. This means we need more energy to stimulate the variable cells on the position array. See this uh, the array was in this in the in the in the, in the attack, the array was a little bit distance from the distance from the array. But after 12 months, maybe with the rehabilitation, the results were very more good. You see that all maybe maybe all good Maybe all the channels were working, also the, the results were more, more good. For example, we had 12% of motions and 30% of fertilization. This was the, the second, was a, a male, very young, 30 years old, and it was the second. But the aspect of it was bad. You see, very good appearance of the centimeters before. This is the first the probability, the, the probability response was 27% in uh, Take from motion and 50% is qualification. Was really, this was the preoperative appearance of the, the exams. This was the surgery. Surgery was in this case was by my mother. We hold the, the, the we have the, the, the array with the fourth needle and other hand we have the the, 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 the force with the attack. You see when you press you see the, the balance is This, has a, this was the aspect of the, of the array before the surgery. The array fit very well on the posterior core. This is the array perfectly placed on the macula, and of course the results were good. See, all, uh, the, all these channels were working, and the electron motion was about 40%, and uh, it was a, a a good result because the scholar organization was about 75%. This was our, 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 uh, our patient after, after one month of the surgery. Uh, the surgery. You see, you see, you see, of course, he, he has the, the, the array on. He can see the, the door, he can see the light inside this, this room. This was, of course, was a patient completely blind before the surgery. This is the third patient I will present is a female. Also in this case the 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 pole is very good. This is a maneuver of the tucking, this is some blood on the force because the shoulder uh, uh, some some bleeding, also diagonal maneuver with one hand holding the, the array and another hand holding the micro the force of the tucking. All this more maneuver going to very smooth. This is uh, this is one of my trick to put Exactly the array, you see this the resector uh, on the edge, in real edge of the doctor nerve, is a macro area, and the array, the, the, this, this corner of the array that is placed exactly near the edge of the doctor nerve. This was the patient after the surgery, some, some uh, spots of blood, because we pressed in the other, and this is the Perfectly OCT with the array perfectly placed of the, on, the, on, the, on the position of the map. See, of course, the results were very good because all the channels were working. And this was the lady only about one month after the surgery. You see, the lady can see the, the, the light, you can follow this, the corner of my department, seeing the light in the corner. This I'd like to present some results about visual field. This was uh, the first patient after one, uh, before the surgery, and after the surgery, you see some more ball islands in the visual field. This is the second patient before the surgery, after six months of the surgery. This is the third patient before the surgery, after six months of the surgery. See how many islands also, they are decided are also in, in the area far from the hospital. This is not a completely blind before the surgery. This is a larger area on the area. So, we have only these two complications. The postural internal pressure, but it was resolved only by the beta therapy and the shallow avoid attachment, which lasts only two volumes. In conclusion, many of the, my friends are asking to leave this, this digital surgeon. I think it's not difficult because it's composed many things. 
first and reward for the back and you have to do new unnecessary things. Don't, don't try to do much for each other, don't try to, to do many things that are going to be. Patient selection, I think it's, uh, it's very, very crucial. crucial. You are a patient with a great satisfaction of those in the selection of the candidate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, 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 um, some of these patients have been implanted now for eight years, and it's really great to see how they can use artificial vision. Uh, so he was Mark's first patient in the Southern Antiques. And he's still today a very uh, active user of the child Thank you very much. We'll keep the video going.